It's a real pleasure to have Dr. Ruth Green to have a first academic talk of the year. Uh, Dr. Dr. Green is a senior lecturer in political and social theory here at Queen's and is the current holder of the most inspiring and motivating lecture of the year awarded by uh, Queen's Education Awards. Um, his research interests are those of contemporary political and social theory with a particular focus upon questions of political ethics, philosophy of work, and economic organisation. You can tell I got this from the PISP website. Um, Dr. Green is also an established editor alongside PISP Ryan with Dr. Dan Bewley and Dr. Susan McManus on Ashgate's series, Rethinking Political and International Theory. Uh, he has a new book out as well, so there's a plug um, as well on Under Weber's Shadow, which is about uh, modernity, subjectivity, and politics in Habermas, Arendt, and uh, McIntyre. Uh, so Keith is here today just to present some of his more recent work on freedom, republicanism, and what this democracy. So, Dr. Keith Green, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sam. Uh, there you go, Sam. I forgot to read. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the kind invite. It's um, it's really, really nice of you to invite me to give a talk today. Um, what I'm going to talk about is a paper that I've spent wasted my summer on. Really, it was a horrible summer. I just spent three months writing this paper, and going crazy. But I eventually got it done, and then termed again. Um, it's entitled "Freedom, Republicanism, and Workplace Democracy." Those of you who attended my class last year in the Democracy, Ethics, Economics lecture will know some of the stuff I'm going to talk about. Um, my interest in this area comes from, I guess, what I found really odd about our society. Our society claims to be democratic. Um, and our central value, you know, is freedom. But we are content to be, to, to, in eight hours a day, to, to live in environments which are effectively authoritarian, and in some cases more than authoritarian, they're, they're, they're feudal in terms of their power structures. And I always found that, found that a bit odd, hence my, my in general interest in workplace democracy. But today, I'm going to focus in on one particular set of issues around uh, workplace democracy and one particular, so it's not a, a broad based critique of modern culture, it's focusing in on three specific justifications um, of workplace democracy. These are not equality justifications, not efficiency justifications, or productivity justifications of workplace democracy, they're freedom justifications of workplace democracy. The first two appeal to a positive ideal of freedom in a sense of self-determination. And some of you will be familiar with these already. I'm going to review those two arguments, and they're very influential arguments for people on the left, like me, uh, who are advocates of workplace democracy. The third argument I'm going to look at is an argument from neo-republican theorists. And their, their argument for workplace democracy, or a regi regime which approaches workplace democracy, is based upon an ideal of freedom, but it's not the positive ideal of freedom understood in the sense of self-determination or autonomy. It's a negative ideal of freedom understood as non-domination. I'm going to review that, and I, I like this argument, and I think it's got strengths over the two earlier positive freedom based um, arguments for workplace democracy. But I'm going to say that nonetheless, whilst this argument is attractive, it's insufficient. And then if we want a, a genuinely robust and comprehensive defense of workplace democracy, we're going to have to appeal to the idea of positive freedom. Okay? Understood primarily in the sense of self-determination. So that's basically the structure of my argument. It's a simple argument. So I'm saying it. These Republicans, they're saying something good, but it ain't enough. And I think the political ramifications of this is we still need socialism. And we still need a strong socialist political agenda based upon the central, what is central socialist value, which is positive freedom, self-determination, and autonomy. So also, uh, liberals appeal to this. Uh, but I think uh, very much the socialists appeal to it too. So to begin, um, I have to kind of explain what I mean by workplace democracy, and I, I, I offer you a definition there um, in a handout I've given you. So workplace democracy is a, well, here's a definition. A democratic enterprise is one where workers slash employees have an effective right, not just a right, but an effective right, to participate in the collective governance. So essentially, democracy is about governance, collective governance. Um, of the organization and determine 
either by themselves or in conjunction with others. And the others that I mean would be shareholders, managers, other stakeholders associated with enterprises. The internal regulation and future direction of the company, the firm, the enterprise. That's what I mean by workplace democracy. Some things to note about this. Workplace democracy comes in many forms. It ranges from what you have in continental uh, forms of uh, workplace organization, what's known as Mitbestimmung, Mitbestimmung in, in Germany, in English, co-determination, where workers or employees, together with the managers and also state agencies, determine the pol policies, both at the enterprise level and at the sector level. So that's where democratic power is shared across different share shareholders. It ranges from that weak form of workplace democracy right through to cooperativism, where workers alone determine the future direction of the enterprise. And not only that, they own the enterprise. So there's a distinction between being able to control something and owning it. In modern capitalism, the people who have real power are not capital owners. The people who serve as capital, managers, CEOs, and so forth. They're the ones that have real power. Um, another thing to note, it can, the workplace democracy can be direct or indirect. It can take a form of direct democracy where all employees may participate in decision making. Or in very big companies, you can have indirect representative forms of workplace democracy. So there's a huge variety of institutional forms that, that come into play here. It's not to be confused with consultation rights. Big mistake when we talk about workplace democracies. People say, well, look, unions have consultation rights. Isn't that all you need? No, you need a lot more. UCU within Queens has significant consultation rights with central management. But if you know anything about industrial relations in Queens in the last decade, it has been determined by strife, by increasing uh, disappointment on the part of unions with the behavior of central management. Of course, here I'm articulating a political agenda. However, um, it is the case that their consultation rights do not amount to uh, control rights or, or even uh, democratic rights properly understood. It's like the SSCCs, right, that we have in, 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 in our school. They're not a right to democratic planning. They're a right to, at most, expressing your voice to uh, managers in the school or the head of school, who then decides whether to act upon your voice. So that's a consultation right. It's important, but it's not, it's not a democratic right. Okay, so what I'm going to do now, I'm going to review the two earlier socialist arguments for workplace democracy, for having significant worker voice. This will be familiar for, for those of you in, in level three who did Baker's module last year. The first one is what's known as the psychological support argument. It has a long, long history. It goes right back to John Stuart Mill and his book, The Principles of, of Political Economy. Uh, Another uh, defender of this argument is a woman called Carol Pateman, who um, is still an academic, still writing, but wrote a book in the 1970s called Democratic Theory and Participation, which is still a classic, it's worth reading. And more recent defenders of it would be um, Joshua Cohn. Um, the, uh, the, the idea that's appealed to here is the idea of positive freedom. So that's the foundation idea, right? And it's positive freedom understood in two senses. In the Kantian sense of self-determination, or autonomy, right? um, giving yourself the rules by which you, you, you lead your collective life, <coughs> that's what autonomy is. Um, and also in the Aristotelian sense of positive freedom, we're free when we realize our potential, realize our talents, realize what we could be. So that's freedom understood as self-realization. Self they appeal to both of it. And the argument is a, is, a, is a fairly straightforward one. They start from the workplace, so this is the direction of the argument. They work from the workplace, or they begin with the workplace, and they move to the state. Now, they look at the democratic states, and they say, and, and their focus is, is the ideal of the good citizen. What makes, what are the preconditions of us being able to act as good citizens? Well, they take an educative approach. We learn to, to become good citizens. And that presumes certain preconditions. They are, <clears throat> to be a good citizen at the political level, to be able to par participate in political democracy, we must have learned virtues um, elsewhere which are necessary for being a good citizen at the political level. 
So they're looking at the preconditions of a vibrant democratic culture at the political level. And they argue, they first off they say, there's two virtues which Cohen and following Mill emphasize in this. There are two virtues which are necessary for us to be good citizens at the political level. The first virtue um, is we have to acquire an active character. And what, what Cohen means by that, we have to believe that A, we are capable of affecting change, and B, that change can be affected. So that's the first virtue. Um, a bad citizen is a, is a passive citizen. So we need active citizens. The second virtue is a sense of the common good. And that is, for that it presumes experience in judging as the common goods, firstly. So that you just don't learn this overnight. This, you acquire this, this ability to judge as the, as the common good gradually. Um, and it also <coughs> requires a willingness to act in terms of the common good. Okay, so this is about desire. Now, the basic argument is that we learn these in civil society, in schools, in as we grow up. And we learn it also, and this is a very important forum for learning this, because it, we spend eight hours a day during the working week in this forum. A key forum for learning these virtues is the workplace. And their, their point is that authoritarian workplaces, workplaces where you don't get the opportunity to um, engage, uh, to act as active uh, individuals, you don't get the opportunity to judge as to the common good and so forth, where you're under the control of managers, these are not conducive to the virtues which are necessary for political democracy. So, if you want to have democracy, a proper, fully functioning and vibrant democracy at the political level, you should have democracy at the level of the workplace. Because okay? that's where these virtues are learned. That's the psychological support argument. The second argument is the parallel case argument. And this moves in the opposite direction. The psychological support argument begins with the workplace and moves to the level of the state in terms of its order of justification. Um, the parallel case argument moves the opposite, moves in the opposite direction, moves from the justification of democracy in the state to the workplace. And the basic idea is, ex is expressed, and the key idea of appeal to, appeal to again is the um, idea of freedom uh, and self-determination and autonomy, less so the Aristotelian notion of self-realization. Um, and this quote from, from Dow's book, A Preface to Economic Democracy, I forget the page number, it doesn't matter, um, it sums it up. If, and the italicized words, are in the, in the original text. If democracy is justified in governing the state, then it must also be justified in governing economic enterprises. Colon. And to say that it's not justified in governing economic enterprises is to imply that it's not justified in governing the state. Let me put that in simple language. The features of the state the political community, the political level, right? the features of the state which justify democratic governance are also features of most workplaces. And if you think that democracy, and you justify democracy on the basis of these features, well, what's good for the goose is good for the gander, and vice versa. And if you don't believe democracy is justified on the economic level, well, then that belief if you're going to be consistent, it would also have to apply to democracy at the state level. So now, Dell is quite, he's not the only guy who talks about, he has this justification. Michael Walter has it, I think in the last chapter of that, uh, his book, Spheres of Justice. The argument is this, so I'll go through it bit by bit. So what is the justification of democracy at the level of the state? Well, there's three, three, three features of the state which justify it, democracy. Firstly, all members of the state, all citizens, um, are bound by general rules. These rules apply to everybody. That's the first level of justification. Second level, citizens have the ability to judge as to the appropriateness of these general rules. Okay. This is where Democrats break with Plato. Classical anti-democratic argument, you're too fucking thick to judge about the appropriateness of political rules. 
Um, if you don't agree with Plato, well then you, you would say that you know, we in modern society accept that most people, all, most citizens, are able to judge as the appropriateness of general rules. So that's the second level of argument. The third level is that citizens are under the power of state authorities who enforce these general binding rules through coercive mechanisms. And citizens have an extremely limited right of exit. If you don't like the rules of your political democracy, you know, it's very hard for you to piss off to another country. And you don't have a significant right of exit. Because why don't you have it? Well, other countries may not want you. Okay? You don't have um, a straightforward right to exit your state. And even if you did, being forced to exit your state because of the rules and you find them intolerable, there, there are huge costs associated with that. Moving territory, moving house, changing banks. You know, your partner may, want, may not want to go to Germany or vice versa, can end up you know, breaking up relationships and so forth. So there's huge costs to associate with leaving the state. Dahl says these features are also features of most workplaces. So he says, look, in enterprises there are general rules which are binding upon all employees. <coughs> Secondly, and against Plato, most of them, vast majority of employees have the ability to judge on the appropriateness of these enterprise rules. Thirdly, these enterprise rules are enforced coercively by managers. How are they enforced? Well, if you don't follow them, you could be kicked out of a job. You, know, you could be dismissed, you could be fired. And that has serious negative consequences. One serious negative consequence could be, excuse me, prolonged unemployment, poverty, um, the end of your career. These are, these are important costs. So therefore, um, the right of exit is not a simple right of exit. If if you buy those buy those descriptions of, of the workplace, um, you have to uh, endorse workplace democracy. So the justification for democracy at the level of the state is exactly the same justification for democracy at the level of the enterprise. Right. I don't like the parallel case argument. There's lots of problems with it. I do like the psychological support argument. I like it for a number of reasons. Um, one of them is empirical reasons. Um, if you read the industrial psychology, like the work of Cohn and Schuller and Hauser and Rohn, area worked on by political sociologists called Kornhauser, and they studied the workplace and the impact that the workplace can have on people's characters, on their virtues, on their talents, and so forth. Kornhauser looked at the impact on, of the automobile industry upon the mental health of workers, and he saw that mental ill health was you know, off the scale. Um, in, in terms of uh, um, automobile assembly workers in comparison to people in uh, 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 white-collar jobs. Um, Korn, uh, what's the name? Korn and Schuller, they studied, um, they did a longitudinal study where they, could, they had one cohort of um, American uh, high school leavers, all at the same cognitive level. What they found, they, looked, they studied them over a 10-year period was that those people who got jobs, and they're all at the same level, they're at the same IQs, they used fairly crude measures, but you know, the measures that were applied uh, consistently. But they found that those people who um, went into jobs which demanded complexity, decision making, had a lot of room for autonomy, autonomous decision making for employees, their level of cognitive abilities remained the same, or they actually increased. Okay, so their workplaces, um, had a positive impact upon their, their psychological functioning. Um, but for those people who went into jobs which lacked complexity, authoritarian workplaces where there was very li limited room for autonomous decision making, what they found was their psychological functioning had significantly decreased in that 10 year period. So their conclusion was work has a significant impact upon your psychological functioning, your mental health, and so forth. And obviously, if you're you can't compartmentalize mental health, okay? You can't just be mental in the workplace and then you go home and, and you're absolutely fine at home. Um, or in, in, in the public sphere as a citizen, you're fine. But, you, know, you, you can't compartmentalize men, mental health. If you're mentally ill, you're mentally ill across the whole of your life. Um, and anybody who knows, who's experienced mental illness would know that. Um, so I think there is something to, to that argument that the workplace has an impact upon our ability to function as citizens. However, there are problems with it. it. 
often will depend on the workplace. There's a compar in a, a American Political Science Review in 1981, there were two papers published, one by Eldon and one by a guy called Greenberg. Eldon found that in certain workplaces actually increased people's sense of political efficacy, their active character, and so forth. Greenberg found the opposite, that democratic workplaces, he was looking at plywood cooperatives in, uh, in and around Oregon and Washington, uh, up in Washington State. In fact, had the, uh, some workplaces had the opposite effect, democratic workplaces. So it depends, these positive effects depend upon um, the particular uh, democratic workplace. <coughs> Secondly, Greenberg found in, in other companies, yes, people's sense of efficacy, their active character was increased, but that, that was not associated or accompanied by an increase in the sense of the common good. What actually was accompanied by was workerism. And workerism is the pursuit of workers' interest to the exclusion of other societal interests. So that's the... So it's a... Uh, it's a prima facie argument at best for workplace democratization. The second problem with it, it's the it's an indirect and a contingent empirical argument. If workplace democracy increases our sense of being, you know, our activity increases our sense of the common good, therefore it's justified. Now, uh, people who, who who want to defend workplace democracy are, are unhappy with this because it's an ind indirect. You know, uh, contingent justification. We may want to justify workplace democracy not so much for its benefits for political democracy, but just because of the workplace itself. So that's the first problem. Well, that's the biggest problem, I think, <coughs> the psychological support argument. Um, the uh, parallel case argument, um, I think, is, a, is now, in some ways it's plausible, but I, I think it's actually rather weak. The first reason why I think it's weak, okay. Managers have it. The argument depends, succeeds, if there are strong parallels or analogies or similarities between the enterprise as an organization and the state as an organization or an association. Now, you just have to read Max Weber to see that there's something really interesting and unique about the modern state. What is it that's unique about the modern state? Well, firstly, it's the only association that has the de jure, not the de facto, we know the Mafia can do this, um, Breaking Bad, you know, Nazi drug dealers, de facto they can kill you, but they don't have the right to kill you. The only association in modernity that has the right to kill you is the state, and no enterprise enjoys that right. So there's a qualitative <coughs> difference between them. There is no real parallel between the power of the enterprise and the power of the state, at least on the, on the de jure level. Secondly, and this is met by a guy called Mayer, I don't like him, he claims to be left, but he's not, he's, a, he's an entryist, and he needs to be stopped. But uh, <coughs> he has a good argument against Dow, and he said, look, Dow, you say that the right of the cost of leaving a state um, is, is similar to the cost of leaving an enterprise, but there's one key distinction. Membership of a state is compulsory for most people. Okay, and this, you know, it's not something you can choose, you're born into a state. And you may want to leave a state, but you, you may not be permitted to leave a state, and you may not be permitted to enter another state, even if you are allowed to leave your homeland, right? Um, but enterprises are different. Um, enterprises, um, you, you, you can choose whether you want to join a particular company. I chose to come to Queens. I could have gone elsewhere. Well, not really. Um, <coughs> you know, uh, but you know, the choice was there. I could have, if uh, I couldn't go to Newcastle or, or the Northern no, no, University wanted me, I could have just said, "Fuck it, I'll just go back to my day job, which was being a roadie." Um, so there were these these options, um, but uh, you don't have that in the level of the state. And Mayor's argument is. If you have a genuine right of, right of exit, that he's focused, if, you have, if you're genuinely able to leave an enterprise, there, um, then there's no justification for workplace democracy. Because the ju justification for political democracy is that you're not able to leave the state. Okay, that's one key element of it. Now he, is so, now he does, I think he's a social democrat, he believes in a substantive right of exit. Unlike um, somebody like Nozick who, is, who talks about a formal right of exit. 
you have a genuine substantive right of exit when you have a welfare state. That when you're unemployed, you get welfare benefits, right? the social security. Um, that's what he means by a substantive right of exit. Okay, so those two arguments based upon positive freedom are somewhat problematic. Um, I th my hunch is their appeal to the ideal of positive freedom is not wrong. It's the direction that they take subsequent to appealing to the ideal of positive freedom. Um, anyhow, I'm going to talk about these Republicans now. Um, obviously, when I talk about Republicans, just to get this across, just in case I'm not uh, articulating an Irish Republican viewpoint. You just have to scratch underneath the surface of Irish Republicanism to realize it's not really a Republican. It's nationalism that's uh, at work in driving Irish Republicanism. Though some Irish Republicans are genuine Republicans, they've read the, they've read the tradition, they know about Francis Hutchinson, they know about Machiavelli, they know about all the key Republican writers. But this is not a Sinn Féin manifesto, okay. Um, right, so there's been a recent turn in people who are interested in workplace democratization or ensuring workplace, uh, 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 worker voice in enterprises. There's been a recent turn to the Republican tradition. Not many people have taken this turn. There are two key figures. There's a guy in the States called Nguyen He She. He's a, a Vietnamese American. He works in the Warburton Business School in Harvard. Unlike most people who work in business schools, he's not a charlatan. He knows, he, he, he's very good at, at, at political philosophy. Um, and that's why I take him seriously. The other guy who influenced me is a young guy, he's much younger than me. This guy, he's uh, Gonzalez, um, no, Inyo Gonzalez Ricoy. He's based in Barcelona, and I think he was, and he's moved now to Levant. And they're two wonderful papers. Uh, their intellectual inspiration is a guy, you probably, some of you guys have seen him lecture here. Have you seen Philip Pettit give a talk? Have you been at any Philip, Philip Pettit talks? No. no. Well, you should go. He's here every June. He's um, a visiting professor. Um, I won't speak to Killian. Killian is shit at organizing um, <laughs> and uh, notifying people about stuff. But Killian McBride is in charge of this. So. Really, if you get the opportunity to go to one of these lectures, he's, he's absolutely brilliant. And he's like, I think, I, I don't exaggerate, I think he's probably one of the top two, three political philosophers writing currently across the globe. Uh, he's, he's an Irishman, he's, he's, from, he's from Galway, trained to be a priest, trained to be a Jesuit, and it's his experience of training to be a Jesuit, the horrendous experience that he had, uh, the domination that he suffered, as, as, as a, what, what do you call a trainee priest? Novice? What do you call it? Seminarian? Seminarian, yes, exactly. Um, as a seminarian, that actually turned him on to Republican theory. And the key idea underpinning Pettit's Republican theory, and it's what these two guys, She and uh, Gonzalez Ricoy, use, is, the, is an ideal of freedom. So freedom is absolute, you read Machiavelli, the key, there's two key values for Machiavelli, liberty, freedom, and stability. Those are the two key values. So, absolutely essential to republicanism is freedom, but it's freedom understood in a specific way. And it's a negative idea of freedom. It's freedom as non-domination. Okay. How much time have I got left? Uh, as much as you want. <clears throat> it's basically another, you've got another 25 minutes. Okay, great. Um, now, I'm, you'll be from, you guys suffered me in perspectives. And you will be familiar with the distinction between negative and positive freedom, which comes from outside of Berlin. Um, and negative freedom is non-interference for Berlin. And he follows constant in this. And then positive freedom is self-determination, autonomy, or self-mastery. Pettit, influenced by a Cambridge school, or the founder of Cambridge School, along with a guy called Pocock. Quentin Skinner, have you heard of Quentin Skinner? I think he's very big. Uh, he's more of a historian of ideas. And Skinner's point was, this dichotomy is actually wrong. And it doesn't take into account the Anglo-American and Italian, what's known, what they call the Atlantic tradition. That tradition of republicanism, which has a very different notion of negative freedom. It isn't non-interference. It's freedom as non-domination. And to, to explain that, it's freedom from arbitrary interference. So the... Berlin's idea of negative freedom is just simply 
any sort of interference. But the, the Republican idea is freedom from arbitrary interference. How, how does this differ from, from uh, simple freedom, uh, freedom as, uh, as non-interference? Under Berlin's understanding of, and this, this is the key, the key thing that, to, that motivates Republicans, is that slavery, the key contrast is being a free citizen and being a slave. Under Berlin's understanding of freedom, which is just simply that people don't interfere with you, a slave could be free, could genuinely be described as free. Let me explain that. So let's say, imagine yourself, you're Greek, you're highly educated. Greeks, and high, being a highly educated Greeks, were highly prized slaves in ancient Rome. Okay. So that's the first thing. Imagine also that you've got a very, very kind and benevolent and liberal master or mistress okay, um, who allows you significant freedom of movement, hardly ever interferes with you. You can do what you want. You can, you know, have the partnerships that you want. You can even set up your own businesses. You can even set up your own school. You can teach Romans Greek and give them proper civilization. Okay? Well, under freedom understood simply as non-interference, you could be genuinely described as free, even though you're a slave. And that, for Republicans, is a deeply worrying consequence of the classical liberal or Berlinian understanding of negative freedom. And the worry for Pettit and for Machiavelli, and, the, and, he, and he follows these, is that the liberal, the Berlin misses out on something. Because even in, you are, you are that Greek slave, you are all, even though you're allowed a lot of scope of movement, and there's very little interference in your life, you are always vulnerable to domination. Okay, for 99 days out of 100 days, your master is liberal and nice. But one day out of those 100 days, he just wakes up with a massive hangover and beats a living fucking shit out of him. Okay. You know, for those 99 days you're free according to Berlin. But for, for Pettit, if you're vulnerable to that one day, to their, to their bad humour, um, you're not free at all. So freedom is freedom from the potential of domination. So that's, I hope, that's a key distinction. I hope that's got across. Right. So this is the argument from non-domination to some form of worker voice in the workplace. And there's a three part, it's a tripart argument. And this is from Sh. so I'm looking at 3B here. Now, why is this attractive? Well, it's, a, it's attractive potentially for two reasons. Firstly, um, it promises to offer a direct defense of worker voice or employee voice. And secondly, uh, a defense which does not presume strong parallels or similarities or analogies between the organization that is the state and the organization that is the enterprise. So the first step, and this is where um, both Pettit, though Pettit hasn't talk, talked about workplace democracy, but he does emphasize this primary good, but Scher in particular emphasis, emphasizes this. There is one primary good, and he's followed Rawls. If you remember Rawls, we've talked about Rawls, or somebody's talked about Rawls, or may have talked to you about Rawls right, at some stage. Rawls bases his theory of justice, one of the key elements of his theory of justice is that there are certain goods that we would want no matter the type of life we want to lead. So it doesn't matter if you want to be a hermit and live, um, live on, 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 in a cave, or you want to be a burlesque dancer. Um, um, there are certain sort of goods that you will need to be able to lead your life successfully. The most important primary this is something, if you don't have this good, you could be rich, you could be really gifted. Um, if you don't have this good, you're not going to lead and lead a successful life. And actually, you need to write it. I've known some people who are really, they're far brighter than I am, far more talented, better positioned socially, um, and their lives were failures because they lacked that, that, they, they lacked that good of self-respect. They, they, they were unhappy. You know, you meet somebody, they, you think, Jesus Christ, you know, you have everything there. You could, you could be anything you want. And, and they, they can't be because they're unhappy with themselves. They hate themselves. They're not, my, my mother says about my brother, um, he's, 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 he, he lacks that, that, certain, that certain good. Um, he's uncomfortable in his own skin. And you meet people like that. Um, anyhow, 
There are certain things which undermine your self-respect. And the one thing that undermines your self-respect, and it's a social thing, is being in a relationship of domination. Now, I'm presuming that um, you're, you, you don't take uh, people who like bondage as your average person, right? Um, there will be people who really get off on being dominated, and uh, being hurt. I mean, have you ever seen the <coughs> Little Shop of Horrors, the remake of that? Well, there's uh, this crazy, uh, crazy uh, dentist who loves to torture people and you know, pull out their teeth really brutally and 99.9% .9 of the people, you know, they just, they, they hate it and they try to flee. But there's one customer who comes in and says, yeah, baby, hurt me. And you get, the dentist gets really frustrated because he just can't cause this guy enough pain. Um, there are some people who get off on being dominated, but the vast majority of us don't. I mean, they, we don't like domination. And, our, and domination is arbitrary interference. Interference, interference in my life without justification. Without, without, without an argument that can be used to justify that interference in my life. Okay. Um, what way does it undermine our self-respect? Just, um, just take the classroom situation where you are a student and you've got a tyrannical teacher who, who dominates people, who doesn't follow the rules, um, who acts on the basis of his own interests, who is very, who has a lot of power, and there's very little restraints on his power or her power, um, and, you, and is really, you know, in a bad mood quite often. And you never know. The most dangerous people are volatile people. You meet them one day, and they're all about you. The next day, they just want to stab you in the back. Very dangerous people. But so that's so that's an extreme form of um, arbitrary interference, an extreme form of domination. How does it undermine self-respect? Firstly, you're always uncertain. You're always in a, in, a, in a state of anxiety, of fear. You're trying to, oh, Jesus Christ, you know, what sort of mood is he in today? The first thing you ask your fellow, your fellow students, hey, well, did he smile when he came in the gate, or did he, did he scowl? He scowled, oh, I thought. So it's this kind of, you're on, you suffer this uncertainty, and it's constant, it's fear that you have. Um, and you're, on the basis of this uncertainty, you're unable to plan your own future. You're always dependent upon on contingent and unpredictable eventualities stemming, stemming from the dominating party. Secondly, to be successful, to avoid domination, you will, people will resort to demeaning strategies. So they'll try to curry favour with the dominating party. They'll try to always be on their good books. There's a lovely phrase for this. It's called brown nose. <laughs> The Spanish have a different phrase, which is equally disgusting. Sucking somebody's socks. Okay, so you suck up to them, it's really vile. Uh, but you get what I'm saying, right? Um, and worse than that, over time, you will begin to view yourself as an inferior person, as somebody who is lacking in, 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 in that, whatever it is, in that which justifies equal respect to others. You will interiorize your inferior status. And you will think of yourself as somebody not worth self-respect. Now, let's get to the... So that's the first stage of the argument. Move on to the next stage of the argument. Um, managers... I'll say, okay, the employment relationship is a relationship formed based on contracts. And, you know, part of contracts is setting out things that managers can't do and workers can't do. But a contract is a finite document. It cannot cover every eventuality every action that needs to take place, or every decision that needs to be made. And in capitalist organizations, but not just capitalist, also in, in, in any society which has an employment relationship, and that could also be socialist societies, um, um, managers possess what's known as residual decision-making rights. What's a residual decision-making right? They, it means that in areas not covered by the contract, they have discretion. The employee doesn't have discretion. And that can lead to domination on three levels for employees. The first level is the most obvious level, how you carry out your work. Okay. So let's say you're working in a factory and you're doing a job and you've done it the always the way you've done it and you have this new manager who hasn't a fucking clue, joins but is buoyed up by, the, by uh, their uh, sense of authority and interferes in the way that you carry out your work. Um, and even it could lead to loss of productivity, it doesn't matter, he or she still interferes. That can be quite galling to people, and it can be quite, quite, quite hurtful when it happens. Um, another, at a more general level, 
Managers have discretion when it comes to employment conditions. So, let me give you an example which may have, you may have experienced. You're planning to have a nice romantic weekend with your, with your partner. You know, this might be the time where you move to the next level, you know, and you've worked up to it. And then, on Friday evening, your manager says, oh, sorry, look, we've got this workload and you're just going to have to do overtime on Saturday. Fuck, I wanted to meet my girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever. No, you've got to do it. Tough shit. They've got to power. So that's uh, scope for arbitrary interference in terms of your employment conditions. There's also a broader level than that. Scope for arbitrary interference. Um, interference which significantly impacts upon your life in terms of the strategy of the enterprise of the organization. So the managers might just decide, okay, we're shutting down this plant in Galway and we're moving operations to Warsaw. Okay, the reason why we went to Galway in the first place it was really cheap, you were really cheap, but you have these guys over there, they're even cheaper than you, so we're going to go to Warsaw. You do have the rights, you, know, you can keep your job, but you can move from, from Galway to, to Warsaw. That can, that's, if it is not justified, that can have a very significant effects upon, um, uh, upon our lives. You could end up you know, breaking up families, um, breaking up communities. Other things that, they, that are deeply troubling, um, yesterday, you might, yesterday your, your, your company was building tractors, agri machinery, you know, and then the manager suddenly decides, fuck it, there isn't enough money in that, let's make missiles. Um, for a pacifist, that might be deeply troubling. Um, so that's, that's the second stage of the argument, the different forms of domination or arbitrary interference that workers can experience from managers. The third level of the argument is to point to the inadequacy of the right of exit. Mayor says, okay, look, if you've got the right of exit and it's, you've got a welfare system that will support you, well, you know, there's no justification for worker voice. Okay, you can leave and go to a different company. Sure, is far smarter than Mayor on this. And he says, look, yes, there is a formal right of exit, and you know, people do have um, you know, welfare safety nets. However, even with welfare safety nets, there are really significant costs associated with leaving a company. The first cost, I've been in Queens for 10 years. I've built up really strong relationships. Um, I've also, I'm part of the sabbatical rota. So two years down the line, I'm off for a year, and I can write another book. Now, if something happened and you know, I really just despise Queens and I, and I had to leave, what would happen is I could go to perhaps to another university and they might hire me, but one massive cost to me is that I would start at the beginning in terms of the sabbatical rota. I would lose all that intra-firm capital that I've built over 10 years. And I'd lose a lot of friendships and so forth. So that's one cost. Another cost, it's really expensive to acquire new jobs. And even when you do acquire a new job, it takes a long time to transition to that new job. Um, a third cost, and this is really significant in, 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 sadly in our economic environment. I'm 39 years of age. If I were to leave Queens, if I didn't get a job in a university within two years, I could forget about working as an academic again. More than likely, I could forget about it. So my career as an academic would be effectively over, especially in the UK, with the emphasis that they have upon publication, publication, publication. Um, so there's a risk of, of losing one's career, but also becoming long-term unemployed. So these are significant risks. Anyhow, okay, so on the basis of this, some form of worker voice is, is uh, called for within the workplace. I'm going to try and finish within the next five minutes. Is that okay? Yeah. I'm talking too much. Now, Hizé makes, two, makes an important claim, and I don't like what he does here, and I think it's really problematic. He argues for a particular form of worker voice. He doesn't call it workplace democracy, he calls it workplace republicanism. Um, workplace republicanism is distinguished from workplace democracy, according to his airship, by one thing. Workplace, workplace democracy entails employee control. That's the key term, control over um, enterprise policy. It may not be exclusive control, it can be shared control. Um, that's workplace democracy. Um, workplace republicanism, his preferred institutional solution, um, doesn't presume control or control rights. It presumes, and this is where he follows Pettit to a degree, 
contestatory rights. The right to contest decisions made by managers um, within the workplace. This is an internal right. Um, so that's, that's how he understands workplace republicanism. And he thinks that his argument, that's all it justifies. Um, what sort of institutional mechanisms does he have in mind? He looks at Germany um, and German co-determination. And there's three institutional um, uh, bodies that he has in mind. On the, and these reflected three levels of, of domination. On the lowest level, where the people are interfering, managers interfere in your work process, there would be internal adjudicative bodies. So you, you would have a rep, representative, who you could go to when you're pissed off at a manager. At the level of employment conditions, such as overtime, holiday, hiring, firing, there would be what in German is known as the works council. There would be something like a works council or a works committee. On the level of, of enterprise strategy and policy, um, there will be workers who are members of boards of directors and so forth. So that's basically his model. Now, I'm coming to my, my view of it, and I'm going to be very, very quick. Um, what do I like about this argument? Um, what are the attractions? Well, the first attraction, I think, that no matter your philosophical or your, your political philosophy, you're going to be attracted to the ideal of non-domination. So it's, it's an ideal which will appeal to, across the board, it will appeal to liberals, it will appeal to conservatives, it will appeal to socialists, it will appeal to, to any sort of conception, any person who endorses a conception of the good. I think it's, it's more effective than this, the psychological support argument because it, it's a direct argument. It looks at the workplace and it doesn't, the argument does not depend on the benefits of the workplace for something else. So he focuses squarely on the workplace. It's much better than the parallel case argument because clearly the argument does not depend on any parallels with the state. So that's what I like about it. This is what I don't like about it. And this is where I think, um, I think non-domination and republicanism are important parts of an overall argument for workplace democracy. But they're just parts, and we need more. And my first reason for thinking that is that if you want to come up with a comprehensive theory of work, and the one thing you'd have to explain is why we value work, and why in particular we, we, we desire forms of work which we consider to, to us to be meaningful. Um, and non-domination does not explain those forms of work. To explain, it, or to explain that desire, Non-domination is, is, is in enough, because that desire goes way beyond the desire uh, to, uh, not to be dominated. So I think to, to explain the value of work, you'd have to appeal to a much richer ideal of freedom, i.e. a positive ideal of freedom. The second reason for thinking that non-domination is insufficient is when you look at domination itself, what really pisses us off about being dominated? Okay, we don't like the anxiety. We don't like um, the, the, the demeaning strategies that we have to engage in. We don't like um, the third one. We, we don't like you know feeling that we're inferior. You know, internalizing uh, this negative image of ourselves. But the real thing that pisses me off when I've been in dominating relationships, I look at that bastard or bitch that's dominating me, and I see what, what really separates us. She's enjoying something which she denies me. And what does she or he enjoy? Precisely the ability to be self-determining, the ability to be an autonomous being. So what really rankles, if you look at the, the phenomenon, if you do have a phenomenology of being dominated, what really rankles is being denied self-determination. So this, that's more, so it's a more, more fa fundamental um, idea. The second thing, and this applies to Petit as well as his aid, or Scher, is, okay, let's, just, let's forget about the other argument I've just given, and just think about what would you need to be somebody who enjoys effective non-domination, who is able to repel stronger parties, who is able to put people who want to dominate them um, to put them in their place and, and say, no, fuck off. I'm not following your orders and you have no right. Well, what, what, what sort of qualities would you need? Well, you need to have, you need to have some sense of self-mastery, okay? personal self-mastery. You, know, you need to have the courage to say no. You need to have the ability to articulate your viewpoint, the, 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 the knowledge um, of um, 
courses of, of, of redress and repeal. You need to have some sort of self-mastery. But if you need self-mastery, self-mastery is the positive concept of freedom, right? So, you're, um, so that's where I think non-domination, if you flesh it out, is um, parasitic upon um, a stronger, more positive idea of freedom. My last criticism, and it only applies to Shep, it doesn't apply to Pettit. Shep has missed the fucking point about workplace democracy. If you look at any argument for workplace democracy, it's not about rights of contestation. Um, it's about control. What workers want is power. They want control. Um, and it's uh, focusing in on contestatory rights is to presume that there will always be an imbalance of power between managers and workers. Because it's precisely because of this imbalance of power that she uh, argues for contestatory rights. But really, workplace democracy, its purpose is to ensure a balance of power between workers and, um, and, uh, and managers. And if control is the issue, and, what, and then we flesh out control conceptually, what is control? Well, control, having control is being able to determine the future. And determining is connected conceptually, obviously, with the idea of freedom of self-determination, the idea of freedom as autonomy. I've spoken far too much, and thank you for your time.